played. Our systems were very old. There had been very little innovation uh, other than uh, one or two big projects that took huge effort uh, and a lot of time and money. First one was the introduction of uh, computer support for the pay as you earn system of taxation for wages and salaries. Uh, the second one was the rewriting of the um, tax code in modern uh, simple English. And the third one uh, was the uh, implementation of self-assessment for uh, business taxpayers. All of those changes took a long time. There was a lot of resistance to them. Uh, the unions uh, were heavily involved and the, the time taken to complete the projects was very, very unsatisfactory. Everything worked in the end, but they took far too long uh, and there was too much, uh, too much resistance. And we had to think as a, I joined the management team, which um, was the governance board of the Irish revenues. So there were uh, 15 assistant commissioners and three commissioners on the board. And we, we spoke about how we were going to make change happen in the future. Um, when we talk about change, we were looking for continuous adaptation to changing circumstances in our organization. Instead, up to that point, we'd been letting things build up to the point where they became emergencies and then doing uh, doing our reforms quickly under pressure from the government and under pressure from our own staff and unions. And we wanted to get away from that model. <laughs> um, so we wanted to be able to plan, initiate and implement change much quicker than we've been able to up to that point, which was about the year 20, 2008 to 2010. And that's very important. Yes. No. Are we okay? I hear I hear yeah. conversations. Okay. Uh, so we want to change that could be implemented quickly and that would develop would would um be of help to all our stakeholders. And the question then became up became, well, who are our stakeholders? Um and we concluded that the stakeholders uh we wanted to engage, I'll talk about who the stakeholders were in a moment, but we wanted to identify them and, get, and engage with them at the start of every change process uh, so that we could have good solutions implemented quickly. Uh, and that me meant involve, identifying who the key players were in change and bringing them in from the start into development of change strategies. So we had to identify and analyze who were the stakeholders. We have to assess their level of interest because some some bodies, like the trade unions, say in Ireland, had some interest in change uh, from the point of view of representing their business, but that wasn't the key interest in in in, in their work. Whereas the accountancy profession was highly interested in what we were going to do to change the the system. So we recognised a range of stakeholders but not every stakeholder at the same level of interest. So we had to prioritize our engagement. And then we certainly needed to develop. Um, uh, can we move on to the next slide? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we certainly needed to develop a communications plan for each category of stakeholders and to engage with them in a structured and formal way. Uh, and. That's, that became the model for for uh, the future. The, the stakeholders, if you just jump on to the next slide, Maya, please. Uh -huh. uh, there were internal stakeholders. For example, the management group who, run, who ran the headquarters. It wasn't clear to us that they all had the same view of the future. So we had to treat our own management team as a primary stakeholder. Uh, some, some of the management group were strongly in favor of change, others had doubts. Uh, and uh, so the, the headquarters team were part of the stakeholders as we saw it. 
regional staff, the people out there in the districts and the uh, taxpaying regions, they were, uh, th those managers were clearly going to be key people in terms of getting support for change. Uh, the top management team, and then line management and other employees. So really the entire cohort of revenue uh, service employees uh, and managers were uh, identified as stakeholders. And then externally, we needed to talk to the business organizations that represented people who were actually paying the taxes, customs agents and brokers. Uh, we tried to engage to some degree with taxpayers and the general public. Um, and then other government bodies, uh, the Ministry of Finance, uh, other government agencies, the law enforcement agencies, uh, because some of the uh, audit work we were doing, we were doing in conjunction with the police, uh, when we were talking about tackling serious criminals. Um, so really a whole range of, of um, government agencies, including the company's uh, registration office, uh, um, the Department of Industry and Commerce, uh, the Ministry of Finance, and so on, the court system. All of those people had to be engaged with. And then in the international uh, arena, we had to look a little bit at what the, um, the EU, the World, Tra World Trade Organization, the OECD, and other member states were, were, were doing. And in fact, we visited a number of European member states as we planned the, the changes we were uh, hoping to implement. And we had quite a list of changes, but the one I will use as an example was the, um, the merging of the revenue service into a single unified grading structure. Because up to then we had tax inspectors, we had customs officers, we had headquarters staff, and they were all subject to different pay and promotional uh, um, arrangements, and it was very difficult to move people from one of those streams to the next. So we certainly wanted as a priority to have a single stream revenue with a common grading structure uh, and um, the ability to transfer people between those traditional streams. Uh, That was uh, the first thing. The second thing was we wanted to bring all these people, once they'd been merged, into a new organizational structure that would be based on a large taxpayer office and four regional operations. Uh, each would be managed by a, a member of the management committee. And this is a huge change from what we'd had up to then, where we'd had um, we counted about 60 different administrative ent entities, largely based at uh, county level. We had uh, uh, 30 or 32 county level entities, and they were all organized with separate customs and separate taxes organizations in each county. So instead of that uh, very fragmented structure, we wanted to have simple, structure with a large taxpayer's office and four regional entities, including one for the capital city. Um, straight away, there was resistance to this proposal and we had to go about addressing that. Uh, so I was one of the... Uh, Norman, excuse me, should I um, do the next slide? Do the next slide, please. Yeah. I, okay, we are... And okay. The next one. There we are. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we we decided we would uh, ask a group of senior managers to re redesign the organizational structure. Um, but, and that entailed a high level design for the new organization. So we actually mapped out this is the kind of structure we want. These are the management structures. This is what you'll be doing. This is how we will uh, adjust the regional structure, create a regional structure, and allocate new roles to everybody within that structure. So that meant six and a half thousand people were going to be facing quite, uh, 
quite substantial change that they were deeply concerned about. Uh, we followed the high level design with a detailed design that went right down to every job in the organization. Uh, we had six months to do that and we presented it to the senior management team. Uh, but in the meanwhile, as we were working on this, the high level design was uh, presented to 200 senior managers by the head of the revenue service at a large face to face discussion in the capital city. And uh, we told them to go back to their districts in the existing structure and to give the same talk to their staff as the senior management team had given to them. So we wanted this to be out in the open once our planning was, was beginning. And that was a really crucial decision because it, it started uh, a really passionate discussion within the organization about our future. And then the design uh, was, oops, the design was sent to all the workplaces. Uh, and then each member of the management committee, we broke into groups of two and we went around the country and spoke to our staff uh, in their own offices in 60 or so locations. And we outlined to them our case for change. Now, we'd never done this before. And it was quite uh, disconcerting for some of the, the team, but there was no other option. If you want to change, we had to go out and argue for it. Uh, to the people who were going to be most affected by it. Um, and then uh, I suppose the, the, Mike, can we move on to the next? Yeah, of uh, course. The next one? Even the next one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what we did very quickly was we created a thing called the high, high level design for the first of the new regions. And I was allocated a new job as being in charge of this region. So the first time in my life, I was based outside of Dublin uh, in the east and southeast of the country. We'd chosen them to be the pilot region and we started putting together the structures that we um, wanted uh, working in conjunction with the management team from each of the regions. So there was, we explained to them there would be, they would be part of a regional identity called the East and Southeast region. There would be a new large taxpayer office, which would take some of the big agribusinesses from the East and South re East region and put them into the large taxpayer's office. So that was a big change for the auditors who've been looking after those entities. Uh, we wanted a new investigation and prosecutions division. Um, because we had been ineffective in prosecuting people for, for tax crime up to that point. And we wanted to be able to get maybe 12 uh, business taxpayers who had uh, been guilty of evasion. We wanted to bring about 12 of those per year of the most serious cases before the circuit criminal court in Ireland. Um, we also wanted 12 customs and excise prosecutions. And we wanted that so that people could see that serious tax evasion would be met with a serious response. Uh, we strengthened the revenue he headquarters and uh, over the years afterwards, we brought in extra specialized staff who we were able to recruit from the big four accountancy practices because we needed to know what was happening in the commercial world now, not four years ago. Um, so they were a way of bringing our knowledge up to date. The, the focus moved to um, uh, how did we become a risk-based organization? So a project then began to uh, look at how we would do our risk analysis, how we would select uh, um, areas for uh, audit and investigation, uh, what tools and techniques we would use. So we began to build what we called a rules-based risk model uh, in the first place to try and identify tax fraud using the taxpayer's own data. And that meant a big build of a data warehouse and a big build of a 
uh, rules-based risk model. Um, and then we moved on to use analytical approaches, which we could talk about afterwards if, if anyone's interested, so that we used um, some statistical analysis uh, models to also get a handle on tax evasion. The focus moved to high-risk taxpayers and aggressive avoidance, and away from uh, small and medium enterprises. When we looked at the activities of our audit and investigation staff in the course of building this model, we discovered that far too many of our audits were in the lower ranges of turnover and not enough were in high risk uh, large businesses. So we had a task about identifying that and changing the way we worked. And that meant, as well as changing the structure, we were retraining our auditors so that uh, they were capable of, of working at the high risk areas. Uh, that meant uh, developing fresh training for auditors in conjunction with our own training department and a university in Ireland took, uh, took a, an active part in this training as well. Most of the staff, it turned out in the end, were pro-reform and we managed to, to get the changes we wanted. One of the Texas trade unions refused to take part, uh, so we, we um, said that if they didn't take part, they could work on their existing work, but that work would uh, diminish over time, and they would have to either to look for another job elsewhere or accept being brought into the new structure. And in the end, they did come into the new structure. Um, because they realized they were actually cutting themselves off from the, the future. Um, at every stage in this process, I think this is the, uh, could we move on to the next uh, slide maybe? Uh, of course. Uh, yeah. We felt these, um, this communications campaign really paid off. When we started building the new structure, we brought out a monthly tax, uh, tax news bulletin saying how the restructuring was progressing, what were the issues that were arising, and we made it all out in the open for, for the staff to read. Um, because the unions, the trade unions that opposed the change were very active in, in um, campaigning against the restructuring. So our boss at the time, uh, a really great guy called Frank Daly, Frank said, we must, the unions have their own radio station, was the way he put it, start our own radio station. So we began to bring out the monthly bulletin. We did surveys of staff. They could choose to take part in the surveys. They were online using SurveyMonkey. Did they favor the changes? Uh, were there things they disagreed with? a whole host of questions every month. Are you aware of the changes and how they will affect you? Um, uh, and that kept us in touch with, with the, 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 the staff views. As well as that, we started going to regular regional briefings in the regional centers of 200 to 300 staff. And we let them put forward questions and we tried to answer them as best we could. Uh, all of those questions and answers were put on a national database on the internet, the revenue intranet, so that staff could look at the answers, questions and answers, and read them if they wanted to. Uh, the, the reforms went ahead uh, despite the union objections. At what this point, can we just move on to the next slide? Mm -hmm. this, this point, we realized quickly that th there were two things. There was the management agenda, and there was the union and the staff agenda, and they were not quite the same thing. And this was really a breakthrough for us. Management wanted change, but staff told us they were worried about other things. We were looking at efficiency, effectiveness, uh, new ways of working. Staff were saying quite down to earth things like, will we have to change offices? Because that's a, that was a big thing for staff who had, say, childcare responsibilities. Uh, will we have the same work? 
will we be trained if our work changes? The unions had invented this character that they called the all singing, all dancing revenue official. <laughs> and because they thought they would have to be uh, competent at all the tasks we are bringing into the new structure. Instead, we were able to give insurance assurances saying that no, if your work changes, we will tra retrain you. Um, will we have the same work? We said yes, probably for the moment, but we will soon have to start building these new entities like the large taxpayers office uh, and the new work load that was being assigned to the region, but we will train you for that as well. And we also guaranteed that um, they were worried that more people would become managers. So we were asked, will we, will we get training if our work changes? We said, anyone in the future who manages more than one person, two or more people would be trained in, in the basics of management. Now that took a couple of years to do, but we did it. Uh, um, so little by little, we were able to give reassurances that the new system would be predictable, stable, and manageable, and would be brought in uh, step by step in accordance with a plan that everyone have, would have access to. Um, and I suppose that, that really, um, if we just move on to the next slide. Yeah, yeah. And this I, already. Yeah. New IT, we had new IT systems that took away millions of paper contacts. Uh, we had new risk analysis uh, and a new uh, management structure with the 18 most senior people in the organization orga working as a, as a coherent management team. Up to that point, every seat top manager had been, if you like, a law unto himself, running his own little fiefdom, his own little territory, as if he were the king. Uh, so we became uh, a coherent management team uh, working together. We got better decision making through the management committee. We were able to faster, to get faster responses to emerging needs. And the, all big decisions came to the management board. And that was a big improvement. Uh, we, the budgets were allocated at the management committee meetings. There were standard procedures for looking for these things. Uh, so management became uh, structured, documented, prioritized, and routine. Uh, and as part of that process, we always had to allocate, if we were making changes, we had to have careful and rational allocation of the IT budget. Because by this stage, we were an organization that was wholly dependent on IT for all our processes. The result of it was, in the 15 or so years since those changes were made, uh, I still am heavily engaged with the Irish Revenue. And I see from, from what they're doing, they've made more changes in the last 15 years than they have been able to make in the uh, nearly 100 years since the Irish state was founded. And change has become routine. Uh, and the tussles and struggles we had with the original changes to the structure uh, have never been repeated. Everybody's comfortable in an organization where change is the norm. And that was, I think, a huge uh, breakthrough for us. So anyone who's interested in, in, in this could uh, look at this paper by John Cotter. It appeared in the uh, Harvard Business Review. Um, and it's well worth a look, Cotter's Eight Stages of Change. Uh, and when you look at the list, we encountered each and every one of them. We did have to establish a sense of urgency about what we were doing. We did have to identify and discuss the changes we were making with our staff and our, with external stakeholders like the accountants and the business organizations. We did form a powerful guiding team to lead the change effort I was taken away from, uh, I set up the pilot region. They took all my other duties away from me. I went to live in the Southeast region for, for a couple of years. Um, it was my job to bring back to the management team, the uh, 
tem the template for a new structure. <coughs> I had six great people working full time with me. And that was the structure we rolled out across the country so that uh, we had six teams working on change, all under highly respected leaders and all reporting directly to the head of the organization. I think if you can't get that momentum behind you, you will never be able to make significant change. We got the message out every time, every chance we could, as Cotter says, communicate the vision. We did that. <coughs> Empower others to act. Yes, we, we tried to do that as well. Um, <coughs> by bringing as many people into the consultations as possible. When we were setting up the Southeast region, um, we reckon we had 40 to 50% of the regional staff at some stage engaged in discussions about the future of the region. Um, we planned for and created short-term wins. People were able to, able to see the new structure coming into existence step by step, and we celebrated those achievements. Uh, we threw a lot of parties for staff um, uh, to, to just say, look, this is good, this is progress, let's celebrate it. Um, and the big message from Cotter was really consolidate your improvements and don't stop making changes. If you stop, there's a risk that the whole system will stagnate again for another 80 years. Uh, and we tried to show that the, the structure we are proposing was an improvement. And by and large, I think we succeeded. So, <coughs> sorry about the fuss at the start, um, um, but that, that, that was our story of, of, I suppose it took, from start to finish, four years of hard slog, um, but by year two, we were better than we were before the reforms. Thank you, Norman. It's it's a great story about the Irish revenue changing. Maybe participants is anybody who would like to ask now any anything, Norman, or should we go on? I'll I'll, I'll wait some some seconds. If there is anybody, please let us know. Write a um, question into the chat box or unmute yourself and just ask a question. Maya just shared two links to uh, Mr. Cotter's explaining uh, this okay. eight-step process. So Super. one is from HBR, it's about his book, and the other one is just a quick video about the process. So I hope Norman doesn't mind. No, no. Yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's well worth having a look at the mm. PR paper um, mm. full. Full, yeah, yeah. The, I encourage uh, the colleagues to go to HBR site to search for this eight-step process. Uh, I just shared, you know, it's a quick overview. Uh, I just had a look at it and, you know, just for the first taste is good and then you can search uh, even more. Dive into. Thank you, Norman, again. So then let's continue with Hans and Hans will uh, let us know his um, experience in Hi. Dutch. Yeah. Can I, can, would it be okay if I uh, opt out at this stage? Because we are so long. Yet okay. My schedule for the day is going out the window. Okay. I really apologize for the okay, Norman. problems we had. And I Thank hope you listening got something out of yeah, it. If people <laughs> would have any kind of questions, I will then pass it to you later on. Okay. Please do, Maya. I'd be delighted yeah. to answer them. Uh, at, yeah either through you or directly to the people who are asking. Yeah, thank you. And we are honored that we heard your story and thank you very much again. Okay. And good thank luck in much. Warsaw, good Great luck. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's all fine. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, so uh, let's continue now with the Hans. He will share the Dutch experience on change management in, in such a big organization as uh, tax administration is. Uh, so, um, David, please give the presenters rights to Hans. Already, okay. already done. Hans, so we heard each here. other. Super, great. Okay, Hans, we can hear you. Okay, that's great. Am I, am I correct and, to assuming that we have until 11 o'clock my time? Yeah, but yeah, of course you can prolong. Uh, we yeah, had because, some difficulties uh, at the beginning. Don't worry. Just go go uh, with your presentations as planned and then we will adjust. Don't worry. We're flexible. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, um, I'm going to go to my, is my presentation starting? Good. So I shared the presenter rights to your computer. Okay. Uh, Let me see if I can find. Uh, yeah. Microsoft PowerPoint, yes. Ah, here we go. Mm -hmm. That's it. We can see it. Super. That's great. Okay, great. No, well, you, you, um, uh, you can't see me. It's not because I don't want to. I, I dressed up especially, but uh, my camera doesn't seem to be working. So uh, you have to make do with my voice, I'm afraid. Um, my name is uh, Hans, and I'm with the Dutch Tax Administration, and which also involves the, uh, the Customs Administration and the Fiscal Police. Um, and I'm going to um, share with you some insights in how to diagnose complex change issues. Well, one could say that in a, a complex organization, a change issue is always complex and it always involves several points of view. In fact, when I was listening to uh, Norman's uh, case, I, I already saw uh, several uh, points of view as well. And I might refer to them uh, during my, uh, my presentation, although I'm going to discuss with you a different uh, case. And this case involves tax collection. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're talking here about the last bit of tax collection where we're dealing with reluctant people who don't pay up or uh, don't open up envelopes, uh, uh, avoid any contact with the tax administration. And I don't know how it is in your country, in, at least in the Netherlands, until quite recently, uh, we would send over a colleague of ours, a specialized colleague, and he would ring at the door and discuss the problem with the debtor. And if the debtor remained reluctant, uh, he would then start seizing the car or even the house or other assets in order to pay the debts. Um, now we gradually see a shift in how we, how we deal with this process uh, in terms of that we are going to uh, automate it and robotize it. So uh, you don't see as many people on the streets um, uh, as before. And it's now dealt with, uh, with uh, by computers and by algorithms. So this is a huge change for, um, for a lot of people, but also for a lot of processes and, uh, and in fact, for the structure of the tax department. Um, when I, I'm a change consultant, uh, together with, we work with a, in a small team of, uh, of around 12 colleagues. Uh, if you would take into account all the different types of consultancy, you would get up uh, to a, a bureau of around 80 internal uh, consultants in an organization which is uh, as big as 28,000 FD, 28, FDE. Uh, this includes obviously also the customs and the fiscal police. But when we, whenever we look at a, a complex problem, we always sort of make it a little bit more abstract to comprehend it better. And we look uh, to organizations as if they were a system. So the tax administration, in fact, is a big system with a lot of subsystems. And we need to uh, know um, which system is in focus in a particular uh, change question. Uh, but always we should ask ourselves uh, a, a fundamental question. What is the function of the system? What is the function of the big system, which is the tax administration, for instance? And uh, you could uh, discuss it as a very uh, simple question. The tax administration is there to collect taxes. But uh, other people might uh, feel that it has a different purpose as well. Uh, for instance, that it is there to make people more compliant or it's there to induce uh, fairness in the society. So it's very fundamental that we ask continuously this fundamental question. What is, what is the sense giving purpose of a system in, and the system in focus? Uh, in fact, this, this really goes along uh, nicely with the, uh, with, uh, the story of, uh, of, of Norman. He, uh, he spoke about stakeholders, internal and external stakeholders. This is a little bit more abstract, but uh, always there are three uh, stakeholders in any question present. There's always an owner. And it helps me and my colleagues, to, if I, because it's not always that easy to find out who the owner is, to ask who is able to stop a process. If there's anyone who can stop the process, you found the owner of the process. There could be more people, it could be an institute, but mostly it's one or two directors. 
Obviously, we have clients or victims, if you like, who, uh, the people who benefit or are affected by the process that we are dealing with. In our case, it's the tax collection process. And there are actors involved, the people within the organization who execute the process. These three stakeholders are always there. There might be more. These three are, in any case, are always there. And to each stakeholder, we can ask four different questions to make a, a proper uh, diagnosis. Um, we can describe the identity of the stakeholder uh, in terms of values or uh, uh, norms, needs, desires. Uh, what is really typical? What are the properties of the stakeholder? And how, that's the second point, how do they exchange information, currency, data with the other parties involved? The third is, what is actually the power balance between the stakeholders? Is it a very horizontal, uh, equal uh, balance, or is there really someone who is a boss and someone who is addressing to a boss? And the last one is, uh, what are the demands and the needs of anyone involved? I'm going, I'm going a little bit fast, but uh, this is because of uh, we, we lost some time in the beginning uh, due to technical issues, for which I apologize. Okay, um, the case. The tax collection. I already uh, told you a little bit about it. Um, the system boundaries is the entire tax administration because every a lot of uh, different uh, departments within the tax administration were involved. Uh, the main stakeholders, the clients and the victims, we're talking here about the small and medium-sized companies in the Netherlands. We refer to them as MKB, Midden en Klein Bedrijf, small and medium-sized companies. The owner is the Ministry of Finance, uh, who is really, which is really the ministry, uh, 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 our, our ministry as the tax administration office. And the actors, uh, actually we point out uh, that there are three directories involved with all three with different directors and their employees and their, all their uh, systems. Okay, uh, let's look first at the owner. And the owner is, let's say, the, the system here involved, the subsystem is the Ministry of Finance and the Tax Administration. Very big uh, ent entity. Um, the identity of our Ministry of Finance is that it's fairly democratic, it's fairly non-corruptive and fairly transparent. Not always, I'm afraid, but mostly it is. The identity of the Tax Administration is, uh, ident uh, the properties really are fairness. We have a lot of lifelong employment. People uh, um, sometimes uh, go up to uh, 30, 40, even 50 years of employment within our organization. We have quite a familiar culture. Uh, we even address the director general by his fir first name. And we have obviously, as most organizations, a very complex IT environment, which tends to become uh, even more uh, complex every day. How do they exchange, the, how does the Ministry of Finance exchange uh, information, data and so forth with the tax administration? Um, it's, uh, well, what's really uh, uh, apparent here is the tax administration used to have a very big amount of autonomy. But there were some incidents, uh, political incidents, uh, which uh, made the, the, the politicians uh, ask that the Ministry of Finance took hold more than the tax, tax uh, administration department. So um, the autonomy of the tax administration has decreased in favor of the Ministry of Finance. The power balance, uh, well, really what goes between them are contracts, reports, orders, a control cycle. Uh, that's really the way how it's governed. And the demands, the Ministry of Tax Administration, due to what politicians want, operations should be cheaper, more effective, and above all, more in control. Now we go and look to the next stakeholder, the clients. Uh, let's go to the right uh, side of the page. You see MKB, which are the small and medium enterprises in the Netherlands, and their identity can be described by, they usually have quite a professional administration, uh, they do their tax returns digitally. It's not even allowed to, uh, to, to do returns on paper anymore. Um, they have a fairly compliant behavior, I must say. Uh, I, I, around 80% of the small in, uh, enterprises um, don't, are, are not really fraudulent. And this is because of the next property, they don't want to be bothered. They want to go about their business and they don't really uh, look for problems with the tax administration office. 
And the last bit, uh, which makes it ever so complex, is there is an enormous uh, variety of businesses. We could talk about the hairdresser on the corner of the street, uh, production companies which have uh, branches and, uh, and operations in several cities, uh, but there also could be service providing companies. Um, well, the identity of the tax administration department, the Department of Small and Medium Enterprises, which houses around 6,000 employees, uh, is very large. It's, uh, they house more or less what I would call archetypical employees, the, the people who have uh, 30 to 40 uh, years of service already. And the, the workload is, because of this variety, uh, quite complex. Uh, they exchange information by means of robots, by computers. It's a click, call, face kind of environment. And usually the small and medium enterprises outsource their accountancy to bureaus. And so we deal as the tax administration with the bureaus. The power balance, well, uh, you, they can't really choose uh, who to pay taxes to really. They, we have the monopoly in, uh, and as, as, as all of your tax administration have in your country, I presume. Um, uh, they're not international companies, they're small, they're housed here and they're based, they're uh, delivering goods or services to, to Dutch people. Uh, so we make agreements with branch organizations, for instance, the organization of hairdressers, or we, make, uh, de we deal with the accounts offices and make deals with them. Demands and needs of the small and medium enterprises are uh, they wish to be treated fairly, uh, equally, uh, my neighbor shouldn't be treated be, uh, any, any different uh, from me. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it should be easy and it should have a user-friendly interface to communicate with us. The actors. Uh, this is the most difficult slide I'm going to present to you today. Um, we have the tax administration and we see the three different departments involved in this particular case. To the right, we have the ICT department. <laughs> which ob obviously provides the uh, machines and is continuously busy with maintenance and innovation. We have the central and automated processes in the middle. Uh, this is really uh, where all the process, but, but they use the machines from the right to, um, to do the tax collections automatically. And to the left, <coughs> we see the, um, the, 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 the really the, 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 the humans, let's say, the tax and debt collectors. Uh, the identity of each one is different. From the ICT department, uh, they're dealing with an increasing complexity. Uh, they have a dilemma. Uh, they, they should uh, continuously work. They can't just shut down to innovate. And uh, they have several sub-departments. The identity of uh, the CIP is they have a very high workload. Uh, the work is automated, it's robotized, and they have certain staff issues. They're working with the staff from um, a somewhat older staff, but the work has become so complex that they actually need more ICT people rather than tax uh, uh, experts. And, to, and the identity to the left is uh, there's a fairly high average age. Uh, until recent, uh, they had lifelong employment. The habitus, let's say, uh, the properties of the humans are, uh, they like uh, to be addressed as craftsmen. They are very loyal and they have a sense of justice. The exchange between the tax administration and all these departments are, uh, is really, uh, in this particular case, job security versus the new division of labor. That means that uh, the people that work in this process are not really the people required to do the work in this highly automated environment. The power balance is, uh, well, it goes just the uh, same as the, uh, the Ministry of Finance and the Tax Administration, reports and the control cycle. Um, the demands that they have are also dif uh, different. Uh, the ICT always needs more money and more time to make better equipment and uh, better to use uh, th that everybody can use. The CAP, they need more skilled staff, diminished workloads and adequate ICT systems. Unfortunately, this is not always the case. If someone would open, an, an employee would open a, a single file for a single customer, a single client, he sometimes has to open around six different applications. And the demands for the, uh, for the people who work in the MKB, and here we also 
encounter these people that usually used to go to the streets and ring at doorbells. They need respect and human interest. This sounds familiar to the story of Norman. Okay, so um, I summarize the objects of change and development involved here. Uh, the owner demands it should be cheaper, more effective and more in control. The clients, they wish fairness and equality, easiness and user-friendly interface. And the actors, well, we have an A, B and C here. The MKB step needs to be addressed with respect and human interest. The CAP operations should uh, they require more skilled staff, diminished work and adequate ICT systems. And the IV, the ICT department needs more money and more time to make innovations. Now, the question is ob obviously, um, which of these issues uh, is to be addressed first? We, quite frankly, in this particular case, which happened uh, one and a half year ago, needed to address the, uh, the, uh, the needs of the, uh, the staff on, on, let's say, the A, uh, the respect and human interest, because we had a, a somewhat of an uprising in, on our hands. And we organized meetings with the directors and, um, and the director general even to address them. This was, this was really the hardest thing that we needed to address, but always you need to address all of them to make it click, obviously. This is one of the perspectives I wanted to share with you of, uh, uh, of diagnosing. And from this onwards, obviously you go and, and, in, and, and, and design interventions to address the problem properly. Um, I have another point of view as well that I could share with you, but I'm just going to ask Maya if there's still time or if we should have some questions. I'm sorry. Yeah, you hear me now. Yeah. Yeah, I, I could go. I, okay. I have another another point of view which I might share with you, but yeah, yeah I would questions. ask people now maybe if they have some questions so far, because we haven't answered any so far. So please um, unmute yourself and ask questions, Hans, or write it down in the chat box. We'll wait a bit and then maybe we can prolong with some more topics. Hans? Shall I continue? Yeah, maybe, maybe I have a question. Yeah, uh, what was the, um, the, how people reacted? Um, I don't know if you started this project a year and a half ago, uh, was there, uh, I don't know, were people resistant or they, they were, uh, pro, um, uh, pro changed or oriented. How, 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 uh, started the, 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 the project? Well, uh, obviously the, uh, um, the, the employees that used to go on the streets and rang at doorbells, they were really, really quite upset. Uh, is, is a computer actually taking over my work? Mm -hmm. That's what they asked themselves. And they had this, they, they were this, uh, they're very narrative people, you know, they have millions of stories of how their work really worked before, mm -hmm. you know, and how they induced, uh, they, for instance, uh, they, there was this one person, I spoke a lot with them, and he said, well, uh, if you look at, I have one client and he doesn't pay taxes, and uh, he doesn't open the envelopes from the tax department. And, but the computer, if it reacts, responds to a, a non-response, let's say, from this particular debtor, it can only react by sending the, this person another envelope, which he doesn't open as well. So he ends up with hundreds of envelopes unopened mm -hmm. and a very mm -hmm. large debt. If they would send me over after a week or two, I could deal with him and now he has an an, an uncollectible debt of around 40,000 euros, where it used to be 4,000, because it, 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 it increases with fines and everything, uh, all, all, all automated, and we, do, we wouldn't have this problem. So it, it's really worthwhile to have me on the street rather than a computer sending letters. Well, it, and this, he has a point, obviously. Yeah. And now we've quite recently we have uh, we had an incident with uh, 
people who were actually, well, almost abused by the tax departments. And it uh, aroused a lot of uh, political, uh, a political storm, really. Uh, one of our state secretaries had to go. And now you see that the human interest is gradually uh, coming back. So uh, this, this firm belief in robotizing and uh, computerizing is gradually turning back a little bit, shifting towards a more human approach. So okay. I must say that I had a point to start with. Okay. Does this answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And we have one um, uh, um, question from uh, George Comisa. Sorry if, if this was not uh, uh, pronounced okay. So, and the question goes, what elements should we look for the analysis Analysis uh, analysis of stakeholders. Which not, elements consi consist the analysis? If I understand it correctly, I'm not sure if I understand correctly what George means by elements. Um, probably, uh, probably, what are the factors uh, when you do the analysis of stakeholders? Or which which elements should you take on board when you do this? Uh, well, I understand it like this. If not, okay. please, George, yeah. let us uh, know. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, well, the most important thing I would I would I would uh, tell George is uh, uh, you really should be should, should be very keen on on looking who is actually involved in this particular case or in this particular problem. So, uh, and usually more parties are involved. In our case, for instance, uh, we have the tax department, which is organized very vertically. In departments, but the work goes horizontally through the departments. So, usually more than one department is involved. So, uh, um, uh, one of the elements, if I would, uh, were to use uh, George, George, George's word, is that you uh, should really look very keenly how they work together, uh, how the cooperation is. Are they uh, really keen only? To, to look at their part in the whole process of tax uh, tax collection in our case, or are they uh, more are they willing to look at at their part in the entire uh, process in the entire uh, workflow? So this is always working together, or uh, let's say uh, the interests of everyone involved, the interests of mostly the directors and the managers is a very important element in my in my opinion. Um, and another one is, um, and actually, I'll come back to that if I, if I continue with the presentation. Uh, another thing is, if we have time, that is, uh, is how are the work processes uh, uh, organized? Are they really, uh, do they really fit in, in what they are aiming to do? And the, uh, the next thing, and that really appeared also in Norman's presentation, um, is the structure of the organization. Is that really fit to do the work? So uh, um, let's say, is the, the are the people in charge really the people that should be in charge in this particular case, or are we looking at the wrong people? So um, uh, does uh, does uh, uh, one director have a portfolio that he really shouldn't have, but uh, 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 but another director should really have it? So um, the elements really are processes, structure, and culture. I would say, if you would uh, address them more or less abstractly. Okay, thank you, Hans. There is another question from Sudarshan Rangan, sorry the, for the pronunciation. And the question goes, how receptive were the tax officers during the change management phase for upskilling and reskilling? Um, well, uh, at first they were not receptive at all because they thought, uh, you're, throw, you're throwing away our beautiful job, and this is really a habit, this thing, you know. We, we are already craftsmen, and uh, please ac accept us as such, and, and now you're telling me that we, we did everything wrong in the last 30 years mm -hmm. or so. So uh, this is really, this, this, you make people more receptive if you really acknowledge the, the skills that they already have, I would say. Mm -hmm. And then uh, build a from from the skills that they are, are, that are read, already are there and proceed with that. So um, uh, you, they weren't receptive at all because they were addressed in the wrong manner. They were addressed as if they uh, did, 
did everything wrong before. And now they have to do everything in another, on another manner. And uh, my advice would be always acknowledge what is there and build further from there. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Very concrete advice, uh, which is very useful. And thank you, Hans. And also, George is thanking you. Apparently, you answered well, his uh, questions. Okay. Next so, time, I hope you. I hope you can see me as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Today, apparently, it's not the the best technical day for the webinar. But I'm glad that uh, we are continuing and we are still communicating and can hear each other. Is there any anybody else who would like to raise the question? If not, um, and you still can do it uh, during the continuation of the Hans Obviously. presentation. Let, let's continue and, until you you are done. Uh, for everybody who doesn't have um, time anymore, I can fully understand you, and of course you can leave the meeting. But if you can afford to prolong it a bit, stay with us. I'm sure it will be interesting because we we started a bit uh, later. I I think that we can afford to 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 go ahead a bit more. Um, but of course, I know that your time schedules are busy. So do as you as you want and um, stay with us or leave. I I understand your uh, positions. So and Hans, please go ahead with your presentations and some more messages for our people. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Um, well, um, we looked at this. Uh, at the change issue at the tax of tax collection from the perspective of stakeholders, the owner, client, actors, and the four questions. Uh, but you can also look at the uh, change issue by looking at the design of an organization. And let me take you along uh, with this uh, triangle. Uh, every organization, every organization always has these three uh, elements in the uh, in the perspective. Uh, the elements uh, from George, <laughs> actually. Um, the business administration uh, uh, perspective, uh, the structure, the work, how, how are the work process organized, what, what are the logistics, really the question is here, how is the work organized? Uh, in the corner below, you see the public administration perspective, the governance really, um, and here the question is, who is in charge in this particular process? And to the left, we encounter the people, the human factor, the psychosocial perspective of culture and leadership. Mind you, I was thinking of this uh, particular model when I was listening to uh, Norman's uh, uh, presentation. For instance, he spoke about the high level of redesign, which uh, to me is uh, uh, in, in redesign in management, which is something, an issue to the corner right on the right below, really. But let's take this model and do do the exact, uh, exact same case as before, but now we put on these glasses and look what happens. So, if we look uh, in the corner below, the, let's say the, uh, uh, the, the who is in charge uh, corner, uh, what do we see? The organizational, organizational structure of the uh, Dutch uh, tax department is uh, vertical. We have a top structure, so we have uh, each department has a director and uh, he uh, answers to the director general and he has his own contracts and his own issues to deal with. Nonetheless, the work goes horizontally through these uh, di different departments. So the question is always, who is really in the lead in this process, in this case, of tax collection? This was a very difficult question for me and my colleagues when we addressed this problem as well, uh, because we, we, didn't, we couldn't really find out who really uh, was in charge here. There were several people dealing with it, but who was really the key, the key figure was really, really hard to find. And actually, I think that's one of the issues that should be addressed uh, to solve the problem. Uh, obviously, we had the new division of labor, more ICT people and less people, uh, uh, manufacturer people, <coughs> let's say the uh, older staff, because we're working, we were working with big data and algorithms rather than let's say, uh, human intuitivity. Uh, I'm, I'm not pronouncing this correctly, but okay. And um, uh, there was less professional autonomy for each of the persons uh, involved because there was a very clear hierarchy 
uh, and it all went up to the director general. The next perspective is the perspective on top, where we see the work processes. Well, it went from, from a more subjective and individual handling from the people who were on the streets and more in, uh, regionally uh, divided, like the case uh, in Ireland. Uh, and uh, we handled it in more administrative, uh, administrative mass processes. So it became more uh, robotic without the human interference and uh, it became more centralized. We had before 12 different regional uh, tax uh, uh, facilities in all our provinces and it all went up to three or four national collection centers with big computers in them. And then we go to the change issues in the human factor. Uh, we had this big difference uh, between the narrative world of the experienced tax collectors and the desired national, the ration, rationally uh, technical world uh, that was really coming into place. Um, the sense of justice was really challenged by the older uh, people because uh, a computer, um, with the variety of our small and medium enterprises is, is such big, is so big that uh, the administrations are also different. And uh, it's, it's very difficult to write algorithms for each one of them. So the only thing a computer could think of is um, uh, uh, sending more letters or uh, 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 um, uh, really collecting debts from the wages of people. But not everyone who has a small enterprise have a wage because sometimes people are uh, also the owners and they don't, they, so they don't pay wages to themselves. So what happened is that in one street of businesses, uh, one of the neighbors was really uh, charged really hard, really harshly by the computer, and the next one, nothing happened. You know, he could he could really um, be very reluctant to pay debts, uh, but uh, nothing happened because his administration wasn't really didn't really fit into the algorithms of the computer. So the sense of justice, how we all treated equally, was really challenged here. Uh, and this led also to trust and compliance issues. If your neighbor is treated differently from you, you might shift your uh, attitude, let's say, towards paying taxes. Um, and the leadership, because we have this horizontal structure, really led to what I call an island culture. You really uh, are worried about your own, let's say, bureau, your own agenda, your own uh, department, and you, you're less worried about the workflow which goes horizontally through you. Well, that was it. <laughs> Are there any questions? Am I still online? Hans, you're still here with us. Okay, great, great. Maya, we cannot hear you. Cannot hear you. Your microphone. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. sorry. Now it's okay. Uh, so, do, do we have any questions for Hans for that particular triangle or anything else? Of course, now we have a privilege to have Hans with us. Also, if you have any kind of questions related to change management, to restructuring, uh, please raise it. Let's, let's wait for some, some moments. Do you have maybe any kind of uh, experience from your organization, from your professional life that you would like to share with others, with, with us, with all other participants, with, with Hans? We'll be glad to hear also. I see a question from huh? George. Okay. Yeah. And he asks, the island culture, is it inside the, the triangle? Uh, yes, yeah. uh, I would say uh, it is a, a cultural feature and it belongs to the, uh, the corner uh, to, the, to the left, the red corner, let's say. Uh, I think it's mostly a human factor. Nonetheless, it's also, uh, it has also some elements which go to the, uh, the corner to the right because it's also how you uh, designed your organization and the governance of, it, of your organization. You might even consider uh, shifting from a, a more vertical uh, uh, design of uh, governance to a more horizontal uh, line, uh, 
uh, which is more and more horizontal indeed, because it then really the, the you put the the workflow on the first place rather than the departments. But this is really um, some. This is obviously this means big or reorganization of of the tax department in the Netherlands if we would do that. But it, it is it is feasible. It is it is an option that we could do that. So I would say that is uh, if there if there are any. Of the aspects of the triangle involved it is by all means the, the human factor because it's really what directors are used to, to do and it's a leadership uh, their style of leadership is really very much involved and i would say that it uh, the, the the right corner is also involved because it also uh, uh, depends on how you organize your governance i hope i have answered your question satisfactory thank you hans do we have any uh, additional question? Hello. Yeah, hello. Can I ask a question, please. Please I'm go. Anna. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. It is uh, is very interesting. Uh, I would like you to go back to the last slide of your first part of your presentation. Okay. Uh, this one? Uh, no, no, no. The last one. This one. Or the very last one that I presented. Yes, just the very last last one. You said here. No, 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 no. <laughs> the one before this one. Just uh, just say uh, uh, stop. Uh, ten. I think it's the tenth slide. The next one or the before? The before. Yes. Before. Before. This yes. This one. This one. Uh, no. Questions, ten. And Questions and marks. marks. Yes, that one. This one. one, yes, this one. You said here we looked at the change issue from perspective of, uh, of stakeholders. How did you do that? You asked them to come and discuss at a round table, or you sent them questionnaires, or how did you do that? Excellent, excellent, excellent question. Excellent question. Uh, well, um, I'm very much uh, for uh, meetings, really real life meetings, uh, if possible. So uh, meetings. I actually go and and uh, and interview people and have uh, a dialogue with them. Uh, so um, uh, with anyone involved, and also to find out uh, what is in your opinion is the problem, or is there a problem in the first place. Or what would you like to do? Because otherwise, it would be very difficult for me to um, to make remarks on what they need and what is uh, what is requested. So I I I, I really um, go about and and and, and uh, I have live live uh, dialogues with people. Most of all, oh. yeah. Okay. And when did you start having uh, these dialogues? At the beginning of the project, uh, before the project, you made a list of the stakeholders and you uh, begin organizing uh, meetings with them, or every yeah, time you think it was necessary for them to express their needs. No, usually it's not my initiative to uh, to speak with them. Usually, one of the stakeholders uh, calls me. Okay. Uh, okay. and it could be either one of them it could be either one of them and uh, because they experience a problem and uh, they okay. say Hans could you please come and, and speak with us and uh, and then uh, I analyze uh, who is involved here and I call up the other mm -hmm. stakeholders to make an appointment but it could okay. be either the client uh, the uh, even the clients the owners and the actors they could it could be either one of them really so th this involves and this is very important I don't know if you uh, if any of the listeners is uh, is uh, is also a change consultant, but uh, for me at least, it's very important to re uh, remain or retain, to some extent at least, uh, my uh, autonomy and my uh, independence. So okay. that I I'm, I'm not I'm not choosing sides here. This, this is really something I'm, I'm I can can do to really play an important part in this uh, in any question. I would say. So uh, I go and uh, uh, I speak with everybody. That's that's. Uh, but uh, and any one of them could approach me. Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome, Juana. Thank you, Juana. 
Thank you too. <laughs> Do we have anybody else? Yeah, I think that we have come to an end. Uh, maybe um, I would just like to share with you some information of the up, up, upcoming events on our program. In this respect, please, David, can you give me presenters' rights that I will share the slides with, with people? Um. Here you go. Okay. In the meantime, I shared the full article is in a book that uh, Norman was talking about. So you have a link in the description. Um, it's a great book, by the way. <laughs> I have this book. It is excellent. It's a classic. Yes. It's a classic. <laughs> Agreed. Stop it's classic sharing. about change management. So no. I don't know what's what's wrong with my. Okay. Can you see it? Okay, so um, yeah. I would just like to invite you for some events that will happen soon um, on our learning agenda. We will uh, deliver a designing, I'm sorry, designing modern text administration blended learning, which will happen in March. What means blended? It means combination of online and face-to-face. -face. So, um, uh, first phase will be online. We will we will gather one week on two webinars, and participants will be asked to do a, a um, assignment. And then we will upgrade all this knowledge and discussion also with face-to-face -face phase when uh, where participants will come to the CEF and we will uh, meet in person and discuss in person. So this will happen in March uh, from 16 to 26 all together but that means actually one week online one week face to face and then in april we will go to pristina to kosovo when we will together with the tax administration of kosovo deliver interesting co course uh, workshop on increasing taxpayer compliance and reducing complying costs our focus will be processes of uh, compliance, but in the perspective of digitalization and modernization of the processes. So we will talk how this dig digitalization is um, uh, is changing the process, as Hans already said. It's not that easy, and uh, robots and digit digitalization cannot replace people. And this will be actually our focus. But of course, uh, our main um, priority will be the processes of compliance. And then in June, uh, we will, uh, together with the IMF, uh, design and deliver a workshop on estimating the tax gap. So. All of you who are interested, you can write to me. The invitations for the first one has uh, been uh, sent out already. Otherwise, you can only re reach me. And if you're interested, of course, you are kindly invited to visit our website and um, apply. Uh, so um, at the end, I would like to extend my gratitude to all, to both speakers, to Hans and to Norman, and of course to you participants and uh, listeners. And thank you very much for your patience. We we had a, a hard beginning, but uh, the end was much nicer. And I also hope that you enjoy and that you benefited from the both stories and both experiences that that were shared to you and um I, of course i would like to also thank our online and event management team for supporting the webinar uh, as you see uh, technology is unpredictable and without our it support we will not be able to do this um i would like to um kindly invited you to join us at the Center of Excellence in Finance in person here in Ljubljana or online. Uh, I am always um, here. You can um, directly uh, contact me or, join, or visit our website. Thank you again. Have a great day. And as I said to you, we will send you the link for the both presentations. So you will just click it on the link and you will be easily, uh, you will be able to easily download them. Uh, so if you have any final questions, we are here. 
and then we will close the webinar. Thank you again. Have a great day and hope to see you again soon or sooner or later. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Thank you also from my side. Thank you. Thank you, David. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. All of you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Hans. It worked out. You, <laughs> You're welcome. Very nice to be here with you. Super. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, people are slowly leaving the yeah. room. They are saying their thank yous. Um, and in a minute, we will close the, the webinar application. Ah, we can. Sorry. Yeah. Children. <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Can you worry. just will, uh, remove my? I will. I will. The markers, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Maya, I'm closing yeah. the, the webinar. Okay. okay. Thank you, everybody, and bye-bye.